Hi, everybody. I'm here with Dr. David Falk, and I'm really excited about that because he is an Egyptologist. And today we're going to talk about the Ark of the Covenant. So what better of a person can I bring onto my channel than a person who's an expert in Egyptology? He has all kinds of degrees. So just you might want to take notes on this because there's quite a few. He has three. Oops, I got this. Sorry. Sorry, my other channel. Oh, OK. My other channel just zoomed on me. So hold on a second. Let me just get these degrees. He has, uh, he lives in Vancouver, Brand, Br British Columbia in Canada. He's a research associate at the Vancouver School of Theology. He received his PhD from the University of Liverpool in Egyptology, and he wrote a dissertation entitled Ritual Procession Furniture, a Material and Religious Phenomenon in Egypt, which established a new cultural context baseline for rituals by examining the material culture of the temple furniture. It was done as a context study on the background of the Ark of the Covenant and is now being rewritten into a new book that will incorporate new findings and conclusions. And he has three master's degrees. So he has a master's of divinity degree and a master's of Near Eastern and biblical archaeology and languages from Trinity International University and a third master's degree in Near and Middle Eastern civilizations from the University of Toronto. His BA is in philosophy from the University of British Columbia. So he has a lot of knowledge and a lot of very related knowledge to the topics that we're going to discuss. And a lot of what we're going to discuss is in his book, which can't, my, my green screen's not showing it. It's a beautiful book called The Ark of the Covenant in its Egyptian Context. He's got it perfect. An Illustrated Journey. We, I listened to him today on Cameron Bertuzzi's channel and everyone decided this is the perfect book to put on your coffee table because it has a ton of pictures, beautiful images of ancient, what we would have seen in ancient Egypt. And Dr. Falk took them himself in many cases. So got some really good stuff. So without further ado, let me go ahead and ask uh, Dr. Falk to introduce himself and maybe share what your, um, what your latest project is. And then we'll get, dive right into this Ark of the Covenant. Wow, my latest project. Uh, <laughs> I just finished up a book review for uh, SBL and just sent that off like moments ago. So that was my big project of the of the week, as it were. So uh, yeah, uh, but I got I I always have something going on. We're always making new content for our channel. Uh, we're really focused right now on uh, getting more and more educational content out there. Yeah, you changed my mind. So I want to I want to dive right into this. So I inherently, and I also want to mention this. There was a debate recently between you and Dr. Titus Kennedy on Sean McDowell's channel, and mm -hmm. it was on the dating of the Exodus. And I think we'll have mm -hmm. to talk about that today too, because you changed my mind on the dating of the Exodus. I was one of those people who was listening to I think his name's David Roll or something like that. Yeah. And uh, and so I thought the Exodus had taken place somewhere around 1500 BC, but you changed my mind with a lot of information and. One thing I wanted to talk about as we get into that is, and also the fact that tonight your, people will be able to watch your portion of that debate uh, or much of that debate from your channel, which is really mm -hmm. exciting. But the other thing was you actually did, you've created a software package where you're able to, you were able to really pinpoint the dates. So I don't know if anyone knows that you've done that or anyone who's maybe listening right now knows if you've done that. I know other people know because I heard it on another channel, but if you, if you wanted to go ahead and uh, let us know about that software, because it sounds like it's very interesting and it has a groundhog name too, which is also pretty cool. Yes. It's called the Groundhog Chronology Laboratory. Uh, it was a uh, project that was partially funded by the University of British Columbia. So I had received a grant to do this. And what it was is how can a computer figure out the chronology of the ancient Near East as we best have it from the King's lists and the synchronisms that are provided. And what this does is it correlates the King's lists to, of uh, say, one country like Egypt to other king's list across the ancient near east and reconciles it all automatically now this is this was a this was a project that i conceived of when i was working under kenneth kitchen kenneth kitchen is the leading authority in egyptian chronology so i was his research uh, um, assistant for three years and i learned how to do chronology from him so I just took his ideas and his method and just expanded it to a much greater scale. 
But I, we also discuss, discovered some very, very interesting things as we did this project, which was we could determine if a chronology was invalid, if it is impossible because it's in, internally inconsistent with, it, with uh, say, its other components. We learn that not every synchronism is uh, that we think was um, unimportant turned out to be very important for determining a chronology. So what we have is this massive database of 500 kings and 200 synchronisms that just sort of put everything in order for, for, for the chronologies of the ancient Near East. We have learned, for example, that uh, the Egyptian high chronology is impossible. It, it has no possibility of working because it's inconsistent with the synchronisms that we find in the Amarna letters. So we, are, we, have, we have started to be able to eliminate possibilities. We also know that, for example, the new chronology of David Roll is also impossible. It is inconsistent with 40 synchronisms across the ancient Near East. So it has, it has no possibility of working either. So we've learned a lot. We've ma managed to learn a lot as a result of using computer analytics to generate chronology. Mm -hmm. Just because of all the side effects that, well, if you're trying to figure this all out in the head, you'd never even think to ask. No, that's great. And I, I think even in your book, one of the most handy things I saw was because for me, when you first when you first come to the Old Testament as a as a new Christian or a, a returning Christian who had never really studied the Old Testament, I think initially it's sort of it's like a monster because it's it's so big and it spans this pretty long date range and I'm tr trying to figure it out and put it all together and have to me the way to do that was to put everything into chronology like I needed to know exactly when did the Exodus occur when did uh, King David arrive Solomon David all that whole line mm -hmm. and then all the way down to the Assyrian kingdom then the Babylonian kingdom the Medo Persian kingdom etc but it was really handy for me to have it all mapped out to understand where everything sat in this. And so your book and your writings on this has, has really made that, you know, it's really opened my eyes. And again, even this chart, let me just find this chart that I just saw. Uh, no, it's not that page. It's, there's a chart on in your book on page 12, and you've got it all mapped out really well where you can get a, a visual of where all of these people were, which dynasty was when and which people were when and which age we're speaking of. Like this is during the Iron Age. This is the late Bronze Age. And I think that really helps me. Yeah, there, there it is. It's it's really handy. And it it just it helps put things together in your mind because otherwise and I think just maybe it's the way a modern person thinks. But I think in terms of chronology or I can't. I can't put things together in, in the past. That's a very Western way of looking at, at history is in sequential events. Uh, and part of the problem for, for Bible readers is that Israelite um, history is not written that way. It's often written in parallel. It's often written didactically. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, we see the book of Joshua arranged from good tribes to bad tribes, you know, in the, when they try to secure their inheritance. You know, you start off with the tribe of, of, of Judah, and you end with the, the tribe of Dan. Judges is arranged the same way, where you start off with Othniel, the judge of Judah, and you end with Samson, the judge of the tribe of Dan. Very bad judge. <laughs> Very, very bad judge. <laughs> <laughs> so you have so much in inner knowledge on this kind of stuff, too, that I think is fascinating because I also watched a little video that you made. It was like a little one minute video that was one of those fast videos where you gave an insight on Jonah. I know this isn't related to the Ark, but we'll get back to the Ark in a second. But give a little insight on Jonah and what you thought. And I'd never really thought of that. Now, like you said, it doesn't work like Bible school when your little kid says Jonah sitting inside of a whale with a candle and a little table. <laughs> Instead, you said, he, what, what happened to God Jonah? God spare us from David C. Cook. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what I saw as a kid. I saw yeah, Jonah I you know, in the belly of a whale with a table and a lamp, a candle, and he's sitting on a chair. He's got he's got all the creature comforts at home in his three days in the belly of the whale. Yeah, exactly. 
But what did you think he what 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 do you think happened to him? And now that explained what Jesus said about him too. He was dead. He was dead. Yeah. And you you just have to read through chapter Jonah chapter two to see this. You know, he's going into the depths of the ocean into Sheol. That's the underworld. That's the realm of the dead. Mm -hmm. So his final prayer in Jonah 2 is the prayer as he's dying. So he's not alive when he enters the belly of the whale. He's dead as a door knocker. And he'll be dead for three days. On the third day, he gets spit up and is raised by God. That makes so much sense to me because what, mm -hmm. what the Pharisee said with, with Jesus telling the Pharisees, you're always looking for a sign. And, and I gave you, I gave you Jonah. And I thought, to, I always thought to myself, now, why is that so significant? Well, the fact that he died, I didn't know he died. I hadn't thought of it that way. Yeah. It, I mean, it is couched in euphemism. It is, it is, it, his death is couched in euphemism, but it's unmistakable what is being communicated. And he's dead as a door knocker. He, I mean, he's dead, dead, dead. <laughs> Yeah. He's not alive in the belly of the whale. There's no oxygen in there anyway. There's no oxygen. There's gastric juices. You know, it's a totally hostile environment. Oh, yeah, it would be. That's that's really interesting. So now I want to kind of get into, I want to switch gears here and go into ancient Egypt. Now, I, I, number one, I want to ask you two questions. One is, how how often have you been to ancient e or not ancient? I mean, how often? I've never been, been to ancient Egypt. Egypt. I'm only been to modern Egypt. <laughs> <laughs> you know, take a little time capsule. <laughs> how often have you been to Egypt? And also, I, I wanted to ask you. <laughs> don't swarm along with me. And I also wanted to ask, like, what a day in the life would be of, say, a peasant in ancient Egypt, and then maybe a day in the life of a king in ancient Egypt, and how those differ. And also, okay, yes, the furniture, like the the different kind of furniture, because I know that's one of your specializations. Okay, uh, which which was the first question? So how how often have you been to, or how many times have you been to ancient? Or to I, I go I go there every few years, every few years. Wow. So roughly every three to five years. You know, there's always something new for me to see, some more research to do. So I go there fairly regularly. Hmm. That's good. So that was that's that many more times than I've been, which is zero. <laughs> you should go. But I would like. To I, I would highly recommend this. Go to Luxor and go to Aswan. Mm -hmm. Those are amazing towns. Both of them are really amazing and a lot to see there. Hmm. Cairo, you go to Cairo for the, for, the, for the museum and for the pyramids. And that's really all that's in Cairo. But down south, when you're starting to hit Luxor, there's, there's a dozen temples down there. Hmm. Oh, there's lots of, lots of tombs that are very, very decorated, gorgeously decorated. You know, then you get to Aswan, and you've got Elephantini out there, and you're you're close to Abu Simbel, and um, and the um, the temple at Philae. There's some amazing stuff to see. And plus, what I love about Aswan is it seems it's a dingy town in the daytime, but when the sun sets and the market opens up, it turns into this explosion of color, sights, and sounds. That's it's neat. really amazing. It's really amazing. No, that sounds Go like there, grab a coffee and some pastry, and you kick back and you just enjoy the ambiance. Yeah, I love people watching. Yeah, it's 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 it's, it's 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 a great place to be. It's it's a really hopping place. I, I love Aswan. Aswan is one of my favorite towns. Hmm. And it's close to a lot of stuff. Close to a lot of interesting stuff to to visit. Very nice. Very nice. I'll have to put that on my list because I want to go to Israel too. I haven't been there either. So I might have to make a little trip all around that whole region somehow. So, so let me ask you, so how is, if you're a, a king versus say a pauper, what kind of life did you lead? Like what would the day in the life be like? What, where, what would the king do? And then what would a pauper do? Usually they're working. Somewhere. Okay. Uh, a king would essentially, uh, you know, he, he had, a, he had his uh, obligations and responsibilities also. The king of Egypt was not just king. He wasn't just the secular king. He was the religious leader of Egypt. So he was the high priest of every cult in Egypt, de facto. So he would have to perform daily religious rituals. Usually in the comfort of his, uh, of his uh, uh, palace. But sometimes he would have to go tour Egypt to visit, to visit each temple. He wouldn't do the, every temple, of course, but just the major ones. But he would do this occasionally. 
But mostly he would be in his royal court where he would have his harem, his children. There'd be diplomats from other countries there. Uh, and he would have to engage in the affairs of state. So that was more or less his, his day. He would start his day with a morning religious ritual and then get into the affairs of state. Now, interestingly enough, the diet of the king did not vary that dramatically from the diet of the pauper. You know, he did not have access to more or better food than, say, a peasant did. Because the princes weren't actually fed in a, say, a better way. They were fed just, to like, just about like everybody else did. So by the time you hit 2021, 20, your diet is pretty much set for life as far as your dietary habits go. And like, this is one of the interesting things was when we look at, say, mummies. And mummies represent the upper class. To be mummified, you have to have a lot of wealth. So you're upper middle, upper class to be mummified. We find in 30% of mummies evidence of chronic malnutrition. Hmm. So even though Egypt was probably the more bountiful of um, agricultural regions in the, in the ancient Near East, it had to feed a lot of people. So there was a lot of knife edge, knife edge agriculture in Egypt. Now, in the case of the peasant, a peasant would be didn't have a lot of wealth, a lot of material objects. Basically, he had a bowl, a spoon, maybe a blanket, and what few rags he wore. They were very, very poor. The farming class was exceptionally poor. They owned no permanent land. Okay, farmland was not a permanent asset. It was an allotment. So what would happen is you'd have the Nile inundation. So basically the river would flood and basically flood out all the agricultural land. It was all flooded. And then when the river receded, the government would assign you a certain plot of land according to the size of your, your village, your family, etc. And then you would work that in a temp you'd set up a temporary hut made of, uh, of uh, palm fronds, and then you would work your plot of land for the agricultural cycle. And then the government would tax that. Hmm. Based upon how high the river rose. The higher the river, the more they taxed, because the more crops they could get out of it. The lower the, the, the uh, flood could spell famine in some cases. That's interesting. That's really interesting. And and that reminds me of something you said in the book. You said the terrain was very different back in the Sinai. It, it was a savanna back then, you said. And, yep. and there were many trees like the Acacia tree where the Ark of the Covenant was probably... Actually, we know yep. it was constructed of that because what it said in the Bible. Mm -hmm. But so, so why did it change? Why did it change? It was part of... The, it was an extension of the uh, of climate change that we see all across the Sahara and into the Levant. About um, 8,000 years ago, we started seeing the end of what was called the Neolithic wet period. The whole, it was savanna and grasslands all across the, what's today the Sahara Desert. You, and, and even up into, say, the Old Kingdom period, it was grassland going up to almost the edge of the Nile. So they would have wildebeest and giraffes and elephants coming off the Sahara, off of northern Africa, into Egypt. Well, when, the, uh, when we started getting uh, at the end of that Neolithic wet period, we started seeing des desertification all across the region. Uh, first the Sahara went, and then the Sinai after it. The Sinai... The Sinai was was less uh, dramatically or less quickly hit because it also was 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 um, irrigated by a huge wadi called the Wadi Aresh, which sort of covers two thirds of the Sinai Peninsula. So they would uh, at least for us for a while after say the New Kingdom they still get torrential rains that would sort of irrigate the whole place. 
No, that's that that's very interesting because I think a lot of people. You know, I always picture Egypt just looking like it is now. The pictures I've seen versus how it would be then, and so it's interesting to think that they had much more plush environment back then. And so I think that's that's neat. Um, so going back to actually one thing that you mentioned in your book a few times, you talk about when you talked about their diet, and you just mentioned a little bit more on their diet is. And I heard you say something about the gods getting some wine and they would mm -hmm. <laughs> the little process of how to wine or beer, <laughs> wine and beer. Yeah. That, yeah. I want to talk about that. So like the average person at the end of the day, maybe they're going to go into some bar that apparently would have like a little brothel in there too, or <laughs> you had some pretty cool stuff to say about all that. So they, and so they were drinking beer, wine. What, what were they? What was, what was there? And okay. Well, I, I think you even said the Lotus, like a Lotus flower. They were yep. getting some sort of, narcotic effect yep narcotics yes they had narcotics uh they would produce uh lotus juice uh from the lotus uh, flower and add this to wine to give a really really potent narcotic effect we also have evidence that they were importing opium from cyprus so they had access to a lot of um, narcotics. They would typically, if they wanted to get hammered drunk, they would drink wine. Uh, everyone drank beer. And the beer wasn't very potent. It was no more than 3% ABV. Hmm. So uh, beer was not something you got drunk off of. Beer was a water purification technique. Very early on, the Egyptians discovered that those who drank directly from the Nile were not as healthy as those who drank from wells. And those who drank from wells weren't as healthy as those who drank beer. So they had a lot of, they, they grew a lot of barley, but they didn't eat the barley. They brewed the barley. So they discovered uh, beer making uh, techniques uh, way back. All the way going, we, we have evidence of of beer cauldrons going all the way back to the old kingdom. You know, when they were making pyramids, they were beer ruined beer right alongside it. Hmm. That's what like uh, Ben Franklin said, <laughs> beer is living proof that God loves us and wants us to be happy. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's, but it's, that's, it's, well, that's interesting. Yeah, but it's it's a water purification uh, purification technique cuz you're boiling it. You're mm -hmm. boiling it. So you're, you're getting that, that water at least up to 70 degrees centigrade to the point where it is actually killing off bacteria and parasites. Hmm. And then you just let it ferment. And you get, you get beer. Yeah. You know, it's, 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 not, it's, not like, like, uh, it's not quite the same as our beer. Okay? You know, it's not carbonated. It it's kind of has a little lemony, slight lemony flavor. So think of it kind of like a lemony flat beer without hops. They would use spices. They would add spices to to flavor it. But it's a it's a very sort of different drink. Have you ever been able to have something like you've tasted it? Or is it how do you find I out? I brewed my own. Oh, you do? So how, how do yeah, you find I did out a, what the I did, I did, I did a bit of, well, I, uh, I gleaned it from the Egyptian documents. So, but I did a little bit of experimental archaeology and decided to brew some Egyptian beer. Was it tasty? It was pleasant. It was really pleasant. Huh. Yeah, you could get used to it very fast. <laughs> yeah, it, as I said, it, it, it was it was acidic. It had a slight lemon lemony flavor. Um, it was very pleasant. I enjoyed it. Maybe maybe you should bottle it and maybe create a little brewery. <laughs> You could have an ancient Egypt brewery. You call it. Mm. I don't think the government would approve of that. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's so funny. That's good. So, so that's the other thing that you mentioned a couple times in your book. I just want to make sure I, I get to a few of these these different topics that you mentioned. But if you had to create an argument, so we're saying that basically we know that the Exodus event occurred around the 13th century BC. Or yes. in the 13th century, and it, it, you had two different kings that could have been under one. I remember it was Ramses the second, I think, and mm -hmm. then there was another one. And if you had to, so some of the arguments for that, and and again, looking at your Bible software, but maybe some of the events that uh, synced at that time or it, it put you to that date. What were some uh, some ways that you came to that date? 
Okay, well, first of all, uh, we came to that date because of the uh, a lot of what the Bible describes about the Exodus. Like, for example, uh, there's a, a, the itinerary of the Exodus itself is, um, you know, it talks about the city of Ramses, which we know as the city of P. Ramses. It talks about the city of Pithom, also called Etham. Um, you know, this is a city that was uh, renamed by Ramses II. P. Ramses was, was, was Ramses II's capital. It was on a virgin site, practically. So these are two sites that are eminently datable. Uh, it mentions Migdol. Migdol was built by Ramses II's father, Seti I. We also find uh, references to Baal Safan and Pihahi Rot, both of which are places that are extant during the 19th dynasty. So we've got this, these, these important geographical markers that are, are fixed in time. They're fixed in time. So we have to at least conclude that the Exodus couldn't have taken place any earlier, earlier than the beginning of the reign of Ramses II, which is 1288 BC. So then you have to go, so that's your, that's your after which date. We also have to consider then the Merneptah Stila. Merneptah, King Merneptah, was the successor to Ramses II. He places, in his fifth regnal year, he creates the big uh, Libyan victory stela, which we often call the Israel stela. It's the first mention of Israel in an extra-biblical text. And that dates to, as I said, Merneptah's fifth regnal year. So Israel had to have been in Canaan prior to that fifth regnal year, which is roughly 1217 B.C. So now we have a before which date. So now we've got a range of about 40, 50 years there. I can, we can narrow this down a little further with the death of uh, Ramses II's firstborn son, which was Amenhir Kopchev. He dies in roughly Ramses II's 25th regnal year. Now we're not exactly sure of the date, but it was around the 25th regnal year. So that's around 1263, 1265 BC, plus or minus seven years, either way. So that, so if uh, we can, we can narrow the Exodus down to roughly that date. Uh, that also happens to be the same time that one of the viziers of, of Egypt also dies. So there's there's um, at least some suggestion that uh, at least it had to be, you know, around this time or maybe a little after. Mm -hmm. that's good i think that's i think that's great because as you know as everyone knows probably in here if you read the bible you know that the firstborn son was was killed when he didn't mm -hmm. have the blood on his door and so that was the whole that's a whole passover event well that was a really really shocking this 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 created some turmoil in egypt this is not i mean th we have to understand that um ramses the second's firstborn son the crown prince was also chief diplomat of Egypt. He was important. He had a child himself. You know, Rajiv II was already a grandfather at the time when this happened. So this is this is this is going to. I mean, your your chief, your crown prince, chief diplomat, one of your viziers, all die around the same time. And it, it would it would turn turn Egypt into a punch drunk. Essentially, you know, their 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 equilibrium is is shifted. Mm -hmm. It's like getting hit too hard in the head. You're going to see stars. You're going to wobble, and that's that's sort of the image we got here of 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 Egypt at this time. Is it's 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 had a, um, much of its um, the firstborn. We have to understand the firstborn aren't children. They aren't children. What they are is. The people who have not come into their inheritance as, say, the next successor, next heir designate. And we're very, very fortunate in the case of, say, Ramses II that we know that this was his firstborn son. He didn't lose his first, uh, like, like a lot of kings. 
in, in Egypt, you know, their successors never came to the throne because infant mortality was just so high. Mm -hmm. We do know in the case of Ramses II, his firstborn son lived to adulthood, both the first in ordinal birth as well as his successor. Yeah, that's see, that's a great fact. That's really interesting to know, too. I think that's um, I've got two questions here that people are asking in the chat. So sure. I want to make sure I get to them. one of them is uh, and actually, first, let me say, I want to say thank you, Jamie Russell. And thank you, John, for your generous uh, donations today. I think that's very nice of you. So I had one It says, Dr. Here's the first one from ENQ. Dr. Falk, are you going to write a book about historical exodus or does the Ark of the Covenant book deal with it? So maybe I'll go with that one first. Okay. I would like to write a book on the historical exodus. Okay. Uh, we tried to raise some funding for that, but it sort of has, you know, getting the funding, raising the funding for that has, has stalled. So it's one of those things that if I had the time, I would do it. But right now, because I can't sort of split my responsibilities between writing and my day job, I have to pick one. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to write a book on the Exodus, but I just don't have the funding for it. Yeah, yeah, that's that's uh, that we have to figure out how to get you the funding so <laughs> to, <laughs> to get one of those GoFundMe things going and see if we can drum some up. And then Jamie Russell says uh, city names in scripture suggest that date that dating must be confirming the dating that you're saying. And he says he doesn't like the idea of such place names being changed by scribes. Do you think it's possible that scribes in uh, you know while copying the Bible change some of the place names through the years? It's possible, but it's really unlikely. Okay, just because every, every, I mean, if we were getting that sort of, I mean, when we do see sort of these, these changes made through to, for updating and that sort of thing, most of this happens during the Iron Age. So this is long after, you know, these cities are extinct. Uh, you know, Ramses, the city of Ramses will be extinct by this point, by the point that they start, say, updating place names and making, say, uh, changes to spellings in, in the Old Testament. So I don't think it's plausible. And one of the things, the other thing, too, is that there are men, some, of the, some of these place names on the Exodus route are exceptionally minor places. You know, extremely minor places. You know, Pihahi Road is probably nothing more than a watchtower. That's probably it. So, you know, to for somebody in the middle of the Iron Age to know that Pihahi Road, I mean, first of all, it's, it's not even on the road. It's not even on a common road. It's sort of in the hinterland of the Pelusiac Estuary. So it's not on the common trade routes. It's 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 off in the middle of nowhere. It's really really minor. You know, it, it sort of stretches credulity to say that this is a, a a an updating of a place name. Hmm. So I, I don't think it's plausible. See, that's something that you've brought up, and I think it's going to give people some edifying information about the the validity, reliability of the Old Testament itself. And I think it was beautiful, of course, when we discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls and that that gave us a lot of credibility. But even going back there, when you were investigating, and I know you and I've talked about this a little bit before, but just in case others haven't heard this, when you were investigating this whole time period and you looked at the Bible and you mentioned before that you found some Egyptian loan words, like some words that kind of hinted mm -hmm. towards the time period when it was written, because that's going to go against, sorry, Derek at Myth Vision and all those shows you've done on Moses <laughs> that I disagree with. <laughs> but that's gonna that's gonna go against what people have posited saying, oh no, it was written way back, you know, it's eighth century and all this stuff. And so I just wanted to see if you wanted to comment on that. Well we do find several Egyptian loan words in the Pentateuch. Uh probably the scholar that's that's best known for this is Benjamin Noonan. He he's done a he did his dissertation on this. He's published that dissertation. It's a great work. Uh, and he goes really, really deep into this, you know, where he, he shows that we find more Egyptian loan words than in any other uh, Semitic language. We find even even uh, the next runner up, which is Imperial Aramaic. We find that those loan words 
are found in documents that originate from Egypt in the first place. So, if 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 the Hebrews are coming out, if the Israelites are coming out of Egypt, or or basically have all these Egyptian loan words in their language, then it does sort of beg the question of demand the question of whether or not they were actually there in the first place. But it isn't just even the loan words; they're coming out of Egypt with Egyptian customs. You know, one of the most famous, you know, um, Egyptian custom, you know, customs is is the the refusal to eat pork. You know, this is not a Semitic custom. You know, you I mean, you find I mean the the history of say archaeology and faunal remains in Canaan. You know, one of the ways we can tell a Canaanite from an Israelite is you know you don't find pork, you don't find pig in the faunal remains of these villages. Well, you know, if, if, if we were trying to make the case that the Israelites sort of, you know, sprung up, you know, from a local tribe within Le the Levant, where does this custom come from? Well, we do find that, say, at the city of Avaris, they're not eating pork. You know, this is an Egyptian custom. This is an Egyptian custom they're bringing with them back to Israel. Hmm. You know, we find in, say, the... Uh, inside the uh, the Pentateuch, things that are just peculiar to Egyptian Egyptianisms that we don't find in the culture of the Levant. Like, for example, when they take the bread bowls with them, they tie them up in their in their sh in their sh in their sh uh, shawls and carry them on their backs. You don't do that with a, with a uh, with a Levantine uh, bread bowl because a Levantine bread bowl is low and flat, so you'd be pressing the dough into a piece of cloth. Egyptian bread bowls are tall cylinders, and they're stacked in a, in an oven like honeycombs. And then you just break the bread bowl and eat the bread throughout the pieces of uh, of bowl. So we have a, 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 this wonderful scene from Medina Habu of a scribe, a lecture priest, carrying a scroll. And he's carrying it in a shawl on his back. You know, straight up. This is how they carry cylindrical objects. It's only, it's only, a, it's only a narrative that makes sense in the context of Egypt. Birthing bricks. You know, the midwives. You know, they're, 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 the mothers are giving birth on the, on the stones. The stones is in the duel. Two stones. These are birthing bricks. This was a common way of giving childbirth in Egypt. Uh, Joseph Wagner uh, wrote a tremendously good paper on some birthing bricks he found that were decorated, highly decorated with faience. And uh, with images of of uh, God, uh, childbirth, Bess, and uh, you know we see these that that these two bricks, you know, the woman would stand on and give birth, and the midwife would catch the baby. So there's a lot of Egypt in the Pentateuch, and these are things that would not be easily explained by just say Egypt invading uh, Canaan and. You know, setting up garrison towns there. Yeah, that that is very interesting. Sorry, my computer's acting up a little bit here. So if I drop out, I'll come back. I just had to, but I, I think that that's, the, see those kind of facts, I think are the kinds of things that people need when they want to go up against the crowd that's trying to pretend that, uh, you know, four different people at different times, the Jaoist and the, the you know, the, the, the uh, documentary hypothesis, that Wellhausen mm -hmm. thing and all that kind of stuff. I think when you get information like this, you've got a pretty good case against those sorts of things. Well, I think I think there was editing done in the, the Pentateuch. I don't think anyone really denies that anymore, at least for the most part. The question is, what is the nature of that editing? Is it a, a, a process of constant redaction and continual updating? Is it taking smaller sources and stitching them together? 
So, you know, it, it it's going to depend. And I, and I think there's, there's, I mean, I leaned more towards the editorial model where, where, you know, Moses was wandering through the desert or in the, the Savannah. And, you know, he just had a collection of papers that were later on stitched together to create a cohesive narrative. Because we do find and say the Pentateuch, these are the words of Moses. And then, you know, it gives you, it gives you the whole document. So it lends itself very, very easily to the idea that these were just papers that are basically collected, aggregated, and turned into the five books of the Pentateuch. Hmm. I mean, that makes sense. That does make sense. I, I, I wanted to ask you, too, about uh, the relationship, if you've taken a look at this. So there was, I looked at 2 Samuel 6, and it talks a lot about David and the Ark of the Covenant and that kind of thing. And a lot of Catholics, they, they look at that and they look at Luke 1, 39 to 45 and compare Mary's visitation to Elizabeth and the way Elizabeth reacted to the way that David reacted in the in the book of Samuel. And I'm just wondering if, and then also they would extend that and they would look at the Ark of the Covenant that appears suddenly in Revelation 11 and then is quickly followed by the Queen of Heaven, um, the woman with the crown who gave birth to the ruler. And so I'm wondering if you've looked at those kind of things and have considered that, and I think you might be a Protestant from the Protestant perspective. I'm not going to say what my denomination is. <laughs> <laughs> But I do I, a smart move. <laughs> but I do have difficulties with the interpretation of some of those passages. Okay. Hmm. Um, when we like, for example, that that so-called that Revelation 12 passage, you know, is really a uh, rewriting of the vision of Joseph. It's really what it is. Uh, the 12 stars of the 12 tribes, you know, you know, and, you know, the, the whole, the whole, whole vision is laid out in the book of Genesis. So we really don't have to go very far for that. Uh, as far as the Ark of the Covenant, I think there's, I've got some, some issues equating that with the, with the Virgin Mary. Um, and, and more along the lines that I think it misunderstands what the Ark is. So, the Ark is not a container for God. Okay? It's a place where the Shekinah glory rests upon. It's never God is never inside the Ark. Never once. He's between the wing of, cherubim, of the cherubim. He's over the Ark. The sacred space is between the wings of the cherubim. Above the Ark. Okay? So, I understand Catholics take a different view of this and that's fine you know but uh, there is there is there is that ha that has to be reconciled with what how the ark is being represented by scripture as well no oh, that's that's good i i you know there are a lot of different kinds of views and, and things like mm -hmm. that. And so I think that it's interesting to look into that. Something else you said, I just wanted to also kind of touch on in one of your other talks, you talked about <laughs> clans and how yeah. clans are a little bit different um, uh, ways that people refer. Would you want to share with everybody what that was about? The way that people are sort of identifying in clans? Well, Israel is a clan based culture. It's all through the, the old Testament. You know, we've got, uh, like, it's the most important family unit in the Old Testament. Far none. More important than tribes, more important than nuclear families. The clan is everything. And it's, unfortunately that, it's unfortunate that most of our English translations are translating these as families. They're clans. And that's what, the, that's what the, it translates to in the Hebrew. Uh, mishkapet. It, it's, it's the word for clan. And a clan is basically a family family group of four generations that could have multiple branches okay you have your main branch of of your clan and then you have several side branches that are called clades okay and mm -hmm. israel was a clan based society so every clan has a progenitor basically someone who the family line is named after Sometimes that name is inherited and repeated going down, say, the clan leadership. Sometimes uh, it isn't. Sometimes clans die. New clans break off and form as, as new progenitors do more great deeds. 
This is why we find, for example, uh, in, like, for example, in the Kura Rebellion, okay? That Kura is not the original Kura mentioned in Exodus 6, who's the son of Kohath. Not the same dude. He's the, he's the clan, uh, clan chief. He's the clan chief. The Korah of the Korah Rebellion is the clan chief, not the progenitor Korah. There are two different people. Another great example of this actually comes from uh, First Chronicles, where it talks about Ephraim. You know, Ephraim, you know, he, he goes to the, to the promised land, his sons get killed by, by uh, Amorites, and he mourns their loss. This is not the same Ephraim that was the Ephraim uh, son of Joseph. That Ephraim died in Egypt. This Ephraim is the clan chief of, of that particular clan. Hmm. Okay. So we always have to be a little careful oh, of, of, of not confusing our, our names. Because it's very, very easy to do that if you don't come from a clan-based culture. And these clans can be incredibly long-lived. You know, for example, we have several Scottish clans, like Clan Donald, that are over 900 years old. So when you look at, say, passages like Genesis 5 or Genesis 11, which show, like, these extended long ages, these are not the, the ages of individuals, but of clans. Clan continuity. And that's how you're getting the 500, 800, 900 years here. Is you're seeing clan continuity stretched out over a long period of time. And then when the son is born, that's yeah, that the is... start of the new clan. Hmm. No, I think that's fascinating. And the, one of the reasons I also think that's fascinating is because I realize that they don't really, they refer to people often as brothers, even if they're cousins and, and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. And they don't have that. The Hebrews, I guess, didn't have an ancient word for cousin like that we do here in, yeah. in English. So, so, yeah. they, so they or, were or fathers and, and sons who could be these. Yeah, this oh, yeah, is that's this very, true. Or grandfathers right. too. Yeah. Uh, uh, your, your, your grandfather is a father. Your grandson is a son. They didn't have a separate word for grandfather or grandson. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. So I have John in the thing, and I actually I want to say, Deps, Philip, I saw your partial question there. So if you have a full question, just do it. Um, I probably figure we, maybe we have about ten more minutes. Does that seem reasonable? That's reasonable, Doctor Falk. Yep. Okay. So so thank you. I'm so this is awesome having your your uh, scholarship on this. So taking back Eden, that's John. He says, is the reed, R-E-E-D-C, an option as opposed to the red C? He said, uh, no pressure. Nat Geo proposed the reed C. And I don't know if you know much about that. It is that's... reed C. Mm -hmm. There's really no it question. It, it is reed C. It's, it's Yom Suf in the Hebrew. Now, the okay. word Suf Yeah, I think is... that I, I heard that somewhere. Yeah, it's, a, it's an Egyptian loan word. It's a loan word that comes in from the Egyptian. Uh, tuf or Tufi. Which is reeds. Uh, we even find this in Exodus 2. There's a very interesting, uh, say, foreshadowing of the Exodus in Exodus 2. When Moses' mother makes a basket of reeds. And she then takes, and those are suf reeds. She makes the basket of suf reeds. And then takes that basket with baby Moses in it and puts it among the suf reeds. So we see Moses being put into the river among the reeds and then drawn back out again. It's a foreshadowing of the Exodus event and the Sea of Reeds. It's an interesting way to look at that. So I have two questions here. One's Callum wants to know if you've looked much into the New Testament scholarship, but beyond that, I want to go to this question because I know what he's talking about because I listened to your five-hour <laughs> response video. <laughs> So these Ammonites or Amorites, am I right? <laughs> Two different groups. Yes. Are you sure uh, which one's in Judges 11? I'm sure of I'm sure which one it is. It's definitely the Ammonites. 
Uh, yes, that was that was probably Titus's biggest mistake on the debate, um, and and almost everyone admits it. So it's my but, understanding he conceded a lot of points with you in the debate. He did. He conceded an awful lot of points, uh, but a lot of it comes down to what he tries to how he tries to argue this as well. Which is he tries to gather a lot of sort of circumstantial things and thinks that having all this circumstantial evidence, he doesn't have to argue at all because he's got this mass. And I think that's that's sort of problematic because if everything there falls apart, then you don't have a circumstantial case. You don't have any case at all. So I don't think he tried to argue it. It was really, really weird because he sort of provoked the debate with his gish gallops and then didn't seem to want to defend it. It was very strange. Hmm. Yeah, I think people, I, I, I mean, my guess is why people, and I probably want to hit the, this is the elephant in the, the closet on why these people want to have this, this uh, date that's around 1500, is a lot of them are looking at this 480 year time frame that's put in the bible but it's my understanding from what you've said and also from what others have said this 480 number could just be symbolism in a way and the numbers mm -hmm. didn't necessarily have to be literally applied and so i think when you get past that it sort of opens the doors to a lot of opportunities on time well i think i i mean we do that have seems... we do have a lot of evidence from from the contextual material that uh, people in the ancient Near East did use numbers in an idiomatic way uh, just to to perform a kind of numerology. So we, we have this. I mean, we have several examples of it, and there's really no question that those idioms exist. Uh, and they exist throughout the Bible, too. So it's not even isolated to other cultures. It's in the Bible itself. But the reason why this is they're, they're, they're clinging so tenaciously to the... The 480 years is because of the hermeneutic. They're taking these, what they call chronological data, as literal. It's a literal reading of that. That hermeneutic is going to justify not just, say, an early exodus date, but also, say, a young earth creationism. So they're going to count the genealogies literally. They're going to count dates like 1 Kings 6-1, the 480 years, literally. And that's the hermeneutics that they are, are tenaciously grabbing onto. If that hermeneutic falls, it also puts into question, say, other, other beliefs that they hold to near and dear, like young earth creationism. So it has ramifications. Is Titus Kennedy a young earth creationist? Yes, he is. He's he's a he's a oh, fellow at the Discovery Institute. Yeah, he's a fellow at the Discovery hmm. Institute. Almost every representative at, um, like for example, at Associates for Biblical Research, you know, they don't only aren't aren't only proponents of the early Exodus state. They're also proponents of young Earth creationism. The two beliefs are joined at the hip. That I did it's, not know. Hmm. So Callum wants to know, he says, can I add a second part to my question? How does Dr. Falk judge the reliability of the Gospels? So have you looked at that? And are you impressed, historically speaking, with any Gospel in particular? Am I? Well, I mean, I love I love the Book of John. I mean, I have to admit, I'm a fan of, of the Book of John. I mean, it's high theology. It's I mean, There's all sorts of, of really interesting stuff in the Book of John. Uh, I have not, I'm not a New Testament scholar. That's, that's sort of out of my wheelhouse. Um, but I haven't found anything really to doubt the, the, the Gospels either. Yeah, I haven't either. And I, and I have to say, I love the poetic sense in the book of John. I just love, you know, in the beginning was the word and the word was uh, with God and the word was God or whatever that was. And the word was made flesh. I, I'm, now I'm forgetting it, but I love that. It sounds so nice. In the beginning was the word and the word became flesh and dwelt with man. Yeah, it's, it's beautiful. Yes. It's really beautiful. Yeah, it really is. So so I, I think we have a bunch of interesting people in here. I've, I've been uh, 
it's been very, very nice to, to be able to, to chat. Oh, what am I saying? We started at, we didn't start at four o'clock. We started at 4.30. So we're just going about an hour here, but. It's just uh, about an hour, yeah. Absolutely wonderful. Yeah. I, so, so I, uh, I wanted to also ask you if you could just let us know. I know you got tonight. So I don't know if you want to mm -hmm. throw a little plug. If you guys have not subscribed to his channel, I've got links in the description, but please go over to, to his channel and subscribe. And so what's going on tonight? If, if someone's just what's going on tonight is that the censored debate is coming back on my channel tonight at 8 PM Pacific time. Okay. And this is going to be the debate with my commentary. Okay. So that's, so if you, so there's extra content here. Uh, if you want to see just the debate without the commentary, we'll be releasing that Wednesday. But tonight we're going to do this as a premiere. It's it's two hours and 40 minutes with the commentary. And uh, it's going to give people a chance to see the debate again. And it's on my channel, Ancient Egypt and the Bible. Oh, that's great. That's great. So I've got John is saying in the beginning, time, past, present, future, God created the heaven, space, length, width, height, and the earth, matter, liquid, solid, gas. So it's kind of mapping it all out, I guess. So thank you, John, for the super chat there. So hold on, let me just get that. Okay. So my issue, my other issue here, I'd like to go a lot longer, but my other issue is my internet keeps jumping in and out here a little bit. So I'm having a little bit of trouble with that for some reason. But Dr. Falk, I want to thank you for coming on my channel again. It's been just delightful learning more about the Exodus and about the Ark of the Covenant. And if you want to watch his other time that he came on my channel, we talked about the Ark of the Covenant. He even disclosed a little secret on where he thinks the Ark went. So some, some have said, well, if you look at 2 Maccabees, maybe Jeremiah buried the Ark in a cave. But Dr. Falk has another theory on that. It's on the other one. But I didn't know if you want to let them know that little idea there. I know you talk I'll let about them watch it. On <laughs> <laughs> I'll let them watch the other interview. <laughs> yeah. So you might also go back. If you don't watch my other interview with Dr. Falk, you can go over to Cameron Bertuzzi's channel, Capturing Christianity, and see it there. So he's he's got some. And actually, it's, it's a very pragmatic response on what could have happened. It's the idea that there's gold on this thing. So what are people going to do? A lot of gold. gold. So. A lot of gold. Yeah, probably close to a talent worth. Yeah. So it, it was a lot of gold on the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah, that's good. Well, thank you for coming in here. You guys, please well, like, thank you subscribe. For having me. If you like this kind of content, please come back again. Thank you. Thank you, David. So I'm going to go ahead and end this. Here we go.